So the Schumann resonance is a fascinating phenomenon. I think NASA explained it best in their article. At any given moment, about 2,000 thunderstorms roll over Earth, producing some 50 flashes of lightning every second. Each lightning burst creates electromagnetic waves that begin to circle around Earth captured between Earth's surface and a boundary about 60 miles up. Some of the waves, if they have just the right wavelength, combine increasing in strength to create a repeating atmospheric heartbeat known as the Schumann resonance. This resonance provides a useful tool to analyze Earth's weather, its electric environment, and to even help determine what types of atoms and molecules exist in the Earth's atmosphere. The waves created by lightning do not look like the up and down waves of the ocean, but they still oscillate with regions of greater energy and lesser energy. These waves remain trapped inside an atmospheric ceiling created by the lower edge of the ionosphere, a part of the atmosphere filled with charged particles, which begins about 60 miles up into the sky. In this case, the sweet spot for resonance requires the wave to be as long, or twice, three times as long, etc., as the circumference of the Earth. This is an extremely low frequency wave that can be as low as 8 hertz, some 100,000 times lower than the lowest frequency radio waves used to send signals to your AM FM radio. As this wave flows around the Earth, it hits itself again at the perfect spot such that the crests and troughs are aligned. Voila! Waves acting in resonance with each other to pump up the original signal. While they'd been predicted in 1952, Schumann resonances were first measured reliably in the 1960s. Since then, scientists have discovered that variations in the resonances correspond to changes in the seasons, solar activity, activity in Earth's magnetic environment, in water aerosols in the atmosphere, and other Earth-bound phenomena. I recall hearing about this phenomena considerably earlier than 1952. In fact, I remember in my first read-through, the Colorado Springs notebook of Nikola Tesla, where he documents all of the research and experimentation that he did at his Colorado Springs laboratory. Tesla, Colorado Springs notebook, July 4th, 1899. Observations made last night. They were such as not to be easily forgotten for more than one reason. First of all, a magnificent sight was afforded by the extraordinary display of lightning, no less than 10 to 12,000 discharges being witnessed inside of two hours. The flushing was almost continuous and even later in the night when the storm had abated, 15 to 20 discharges per minute were witnessed. Some of the discharges were of a wonderful brilliancy and showed often 10 or twice as many branches. They also appeared frequently thicker on the bottom than on top. Can this be so? Perhaps it was only due to the fact that the portion close to the ground was nearer to the observer. The storm began to be perceptible at a distance as it grew dark and continuously increased. An instrument, a rotating coherer, was connected to ground and a plate above ground. As in my plan of telegraphy, and a condenser was used to magnify the effects transmitted through the ground. This Method of magnifying secures much better results and will be described in detail in many modifications. I used it in investigating properties of Leonard and Ranjan rays with excellent results. The relay was not adjusted very sensitively, but it began to play, nevertheless, when a storm was still at a distance of about 80 to 100 miles. That is, judging the distance from the velocity of sound. As the storm got nearer, the adjustment had to be rendered less and less sensitive until the limit of the strength of the spring was reached. But even then, it played at every discharge. An ordinary bell was connected to Earth and elevated terminal and often it also responded. A small spark gap was bridged by a bright spark when the lightning occurred in the neighborhood. By holding the hands across the gap, a shock was felt indicating the strength of the current passing between the ground and the insulated plate. As the storm receded, the most interesting and valuable observation was made. It happened this way. The instrument was again adjusted so as to be more sensitive and to respond readily to every discharge which was seen or heard. It did so for a while when it stopped. It was thought that the lightning was now too far away and it may have been about 50 miles away. All of a sudden, the instrument began again to play, continuously increasing in strength, although the storm was moving very rapidly. After some time, the indications again ceased, but half an hour later, the instrument began to record again. When it once more ceased, the adjustment was rendered more delicate. In fact, very considerably so. Still, the instrument failed to respond, but half an hour or so, it again began to play, and now the spring was tightened on the relay very much, and it still indicated the discharges. And by this time, 
The storm had moved away, far out of sight. By readjusting the instrument and setting it again so as to be very sensitive, after some time, it again began to play periodically. The storm was now at a distance greater than 200 miles at least. Later in the evening, repeatedly, the instrument played and ceased to play in intervals of nearly half an hour, although most of the horizon was clear by that time. This was a wonderful and most interesting experience from the scientific point of view. It showed clearly the existence of stationary waves, for how could the observations be otherwise explained? How can these waves be stationary unless reflected, and where can they be reflected from unless from the point where they started? It would be difficult to believe that they were reflected from the opposite point of the Earth's surface, though it may be possible, but I rather think they are reflected from a point of the cloud where the conducting path began. In this case, the point where the lightning struck the ground would be a nodal point. It is now certain that they can be produced with an oscillator. This is of immense importance. It seems to me that was him reliably measuring them in 1899. Strangely, he wasn't mentioned in NASA's article, yet he seems to have discovered this phenomena in 1899, using instruments which were incredibly simple, yet astoundingly precise, sensitive, and very well engineered for their time. He had no computers, no transistors, just simple devices of his own construction, which told him things about the universe and the rest of the world that it took 50 years to catch up on. Now, I've noticed Tesla gets little credit for this discovery, or many discoveries, but this one is named for someone else, which is the scientist who got credit for discovering it. Despite the fact that Tesla experimentally proved it, understood it, and integrated this concept into most of the rest of his work going forward, I certainly will never see it become the Tesla resonance, no? It's amazing to me how much he knew, how much he accomplished, and how much he defined the modern age with his brilliance. Without any fancy technology, on his own, using simple equations and practical experimentation with a deep and meaningful understanding of the universal process, Tesla discovered many things it took mainstream science a century to fully understand. And he still gets no credit for them. It took science a long time to even begin to discover what Tesla instinctively understood. If you want to know the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration.